I'll take the sort of moderator's uh, prerogative and ask the first question. Um, so, John, I think uh, you know towards the end you were sort of honing in on Pickwell and the idea that there's a real role for AI in helping sort of consumers uh, and I think policymakers shape policy to help consumers make better decisions. Yeah. And Ziad, in some of your other research, you've shown that you know algorithm and AI-based decision making is great, but there's an inherent flaw in that, right? Which is that it's dependent on the data that we're feeding into the system. Um, and so, with an eye towards the people that we have in the room, you know that to me creates this problem, right? Which is like, how do we, how do we sort of feed the right data into the system? Uh, and how do we do it on a scale that's bigger than just looking at needs, right? How do we turn this into data that actually feeds into the much larger health discussion that we're having? Sure, I mean, I, I think that's central, you know, the Nightingale's the answer. Uh, but I, I mean, I think uh, this is a, an interesting challenge and I'll, you know, I wear a lot of hats in this capacity, my researcher hat, my Pickwell hat, and then sort of advising startups. And I think the interesting thing, and one reason, frankly, Pickwell jumped much faster is the understanding of data availability that came from wearing a research hat on the, in that capacity. And particularly in the healthcare domain, the access to data, uh, particularly diverse data, um, but even just generally large scale data for health kinds of questions, uh, is central and is often forgotten. Um, if you think about a startup, you know, one reason they come up with a slick UX and nice front end is because there's the chicken and egg problem. If only people use this, then we'll have lots of data. But then you end up with a very unrepresentative sample. So, you know, I'm not sure, maybe not in for collective health here, but collective health is not represent, you know, they're not grabbing amazing data on the universe of, of people. They're grabbing basically people who drive up and down the 101 and need primary care visits, which is a fantastically valuable. Um, and I think there's a role for policymakers and, uh, and that interaction, which is critical. So you've seen a lot of states do so-called all all payer claims data, which are an amazing resource. They are basically the universe of the state's population, often linked to other sources of data. California is embarking on one now. Those, I think, will be absolutely uh, essential. Um, the other piece to this is these large-scale um, commercial data sets uh, that are available. And I think you know, that is at least a silver lining to some of the concentration uh, in the healthcare industry is that these data sets are available at large scale. But there, that gap is, I think, absolutely essential to lots of these solutions and making them broader and more representative. And actually, CMS is also and has been doing, a, I think, a pretty good job of making Medicare and Medicaid data. Because again, that's where a lot of the action is generally in health and particularly in the domains we're talking about here. Yeah, I think picking up on John's last point about Medicare data, I think um, one of our, when we were thinking about what, what we could do to, to solve exactly this problem, the, the Medicare data, I think, are a really nice example of how the availability of those data sets at strategic institutions, um, NBER, different um, academic institutions, in some ways really created the field of health economics uh, as, as, we, as we know it today. Um, and so I think it, it just highlights the huge role in, in data sets in creating those kinds of communities around, um, uh, around the data. Now, there's another half well, I don't know if it's half, but th the other part of that is actually the, the people and creating that, like, that community of people. And so I was actually really impressed yesterday. I, I think this, um, this event is like just a wonderful place where people who have data might meet someone who has a good idea about how to analyze those data. When I think about um, our research projects, so many of them have come out of these kind of chance, not chance encounters, but just um, lucky encounters, at least at conferences or at... Um, at other events, um, and so I, I think that there's some marketplace that that is that is very very useful, and that I'm, I'm very grateful that uh, you guys are um, have, have organized this event. Um, the, the last component is actually just also on that on that human side of the equation, developing a community of people who are sufficiently invested in these kinds of questions and also knowledgeable enough about the methods. And I think that's kind of hard because I think that, you know, I, you know John, John's an economist, but John has spent a ton of time learning a lot about health and how the health system works. And like he, you know, he said, oh, the Browns plan, you guys all know what that is. But it's like <laughs> that, knowing what that is takes an enormous amount of investment. And I think, um, and I think that that's a, that's a final component that's underrated is like we don't necessarily have pipelines that are producing people that do this kind of 
work. Um, so let me ask, uh, hone in on that question you said, because I think one of the central questions that we want to answer with this conference is how do, we, how do we marry up private industry with academics? How do we take it out of this silo? And we sort of talked about conferences like this, but I'd love to hear sort of some additional thoughts about sort of how else we can do, we can do this better. I think, uh, you know, before uh, I was working in this space, a lot of my work was in the homeland security space, and it struck me that, you know, sort of after 9-11, we saw this incredible sort of privatization of security data or the access of that data to private industry. And we've seen growth of lots of companies here in Silicon Valley that have sort of leveraged and sort of built companies in that space. Is there a similar role or a similar sort of thing that needs to happen in healthcare for this to happen? Or what, is that, what does that need to look like for us to work better with private industry? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think that's a huge opportunity. And I think it can fill a couple of roles. Um, and it relates a little bit to what, what Ziad was saying. I mean, I, I think one of the big gaps uh, you see this a lot, sort of the playbook, successful entrepreneur, tech pedigree, health is big, health is broken, here, here I am. And then you see them two years later, grumpily floundering if you get, you know, if you get, if you get them a beer and they tell you what they're actually doing. Uh, and often that gap comes down to, well, I got a fantastic data science team. Well, they're actually a really good data engineering team from a tech company, and we don't have anyone that really understands how to take, maybe even if they have the right data, how to take that to intervention because it's messy and it's complicated. Um, and I think that actually presents a real opportunity. You know, it's something that we both work on either by literally going all the way, in the case of Pickwell, and just starting the company, but I think more frequently and more effectively, because that's a lot of other work, <laughs> is, to, uh, is to figure out ways to more effectively partner. You know, we've had really good research projects or engagements where there is this kind of, um, I, I can call it last mile data science, which is how do we take this rich data set and the product we're trying to build and figure out you know, which patients should be enrolled in this program to intervene and help them, um, help them exercise so they don't break their hip. That's actually a kind of complicated, it depends on Medicare rules, it depends on the data, it depends on causal inference and machine learning. And that's actually one where you can, you know, that's a specific example. But I think there is more of that. That's a real opportunity there. And actually a, a, a silver lining to HIPAA, which is the oft, uh, oft pilloried data rule in healthcare, is actually there is a structure for data sharing. It can constrain you on some dimensions, but it's also the case that you know, both the legal on the, the partner side and the legal on the university side, even at the behemoth that is Berkeley, can understand what's going on. And I think that could be leveraged more to do these kinds of relationships. And I think lots of universities are increasingly open to it, doing this. I will also give a plug that Microsoft Research has been tremendously uh, impactful on, for, for me personally, but also I think on that domain, healthcare was not in their purview, but I think Jennifer Chase in particular and, and Susan realize this is a big part of the economy and the data to, do, to work with this are not, are in the private side and some of the questions and institutional knowledge is on the, the academic side. Yeah, I think I, I have some optimism that, that hopefully isn't unfounded uh, that I think academia can play uh, a catalytic role, as John alluded to, you wouldn't necessarily want a lot of academics going out and founding companies because that requires work that we're not very well suited to do often. <laughs> um, but but I think that strategic partnerships with companies can actually be very productive in in, in the following sense. And I actually think you know, for example, the the work that Susan has done with different companies has been catalytic in essentially, you know teaching a bunch of people in tech how to do randomized trials. I mean, they, they call it A-B testing, but yeah. you know, they're, which is fine, uh, but, but they're randomized <laughs> trials. In the sense, they randomized trials, since, since I have Mario up here, uh, that, was, that was medicine. That, we, we came up with those. Uh, <laughs> so you're welcome, uh, all of you. But, um, but, but I think that that's, I, for me, it, that, you know, Susan's work's been really inspirational in showing how those kinds of partnerships can, can just um, show the playbook for, for a whole industry to start doing things really rigorously. And of course, it's not just Susan, it's uh, Steve Dallas and, and other people who have worked with these companies, but, but I think there's been that almost tech transfer hmm. model from, from academia to, to industries that I hope can help here as well. So we can open it up for questions.
So Andrea Levere again. Um, there's a huge growing movement that connects the um, fin fintech or health and wealth growing. And um, there is also a somewhat revolutionary movement looking at how do we reallocate the spending, the healthcare spending on the upstream determinants of health because they have such a profound impact on health and particularly given the data you shared of both by race and by income or wealth. Um, so my question is, um, what research do you see happening in this space? And the most concrete example is Kaiser deciding to invest $200 million in increasing access to affordable housing, which is just the tip of the iceberg in where these investments are going. Yeah, so I mean, I think, uh, and I didn't, you know, in my, my haste didn't sort of, there was a little, at the end, one of the solutions had Kaiser in parentheses, and, and it doesn't specifically need to be Kaiser, though I think they are the best example of it. I think this reflects the opportunity. Um, when you have an aligned organization, that's much more likely to adopt the kind of innovative and inclusive technology solutions that have been so hard to sell. I'll call healthcare a point solution. If you walk into a Blue Cross plan and they're going to enroll someone at best for three years in the prime of their life, um, the ability to get them to invest in housing or to sell them a tool that's going to identify people that have, you know, uh, other aspects of their life that's contributing to their use uh, or under use of, say, preventive medicine today that's going to that's going to manifest itself later, I think is very challenging. So there are some institutional features that can complement a lot of this, um, this innovation on that domain. And I certainly think the health and wealth confluence is absolutely essential, both, um, you know, if I think about uh, We've looked, for example, in the state of Utah where we have all payer claims data linked to people's employers. I can show you that the type of industry and income matters a ton, not just for access. I mean, these are within the same types of plans, but whether or not you take your medications and, uh, and in very subtle ways that is almost certainly unrelated or related very much to liquidity, to ability to pay. And I will say a specific example. So when Pickwell rolled out um, somewhat uh, with a big flourish, uh, they moved all Starbucks employees onto one of these exchanges that we were powering. And, you know, we were pretty good at accounting for risk aversion and trying to deal with that. But what we, the CEO called up very quickly and said, lots of my employees are getting in high deductible plans. They're baristas. They cannot afford $500 or a $1,000 shock in a month, let alone more. And so what we actually ended up doing was that sort of this very much this liquidity piece of it, uh, getting better data on income uh, and budgets and also building in basically to the, the match the fact that illiquid people uh, should frankly be paying more in premium uh, on a steady basis so that they don't have these shocks. This question is for Ziad. Ziad, as you think about the translational strategy for your work, uh, what do you think would be required uh, to actually uh, have your algorithm or, or this approach in general actually start driving real world clinical decision making, number one? And number two, how important uh, would explainable AI be for increasing the likelihood of adoption? So DARPA has a program in this area because if you say, hey, I have this you know, multi-layer convolutional neural network and it's, you know, telling you to do this, is that something that, you know, lots of MDs and policymakers are, are going to be comfortable embracing? Um, gr great questions, I, I think, and I think related questions, uh, of course. Um, so m maybe I'll, I'll do the second one first. I think, yes, there's an enormous amount of interest in um, explainability, interpretability. I think um, one of the things that is, is unique and interesting about medicine is how often we use things that we fundamentally don't understand and can't explain already. And so for example, no one has any, like not the slightest idea how um, antidepressants work, how metformin works. Um, most doctors, I would say, if you, you know, if you asked uh, 
a doctor reading an MRI to explain to you the, um, how the spin of the hydrogen particles uh, lines up and decays to, to form the image. So, so I think we're starting from a base where medicine's a very applied field. Like we use things because they work. And so, um, and so this is not to say that we shouldn't try to understand them because I think that understanding exactly what the algorithm is seeing is deeply interesting and the key to unlocking a lot of new therapeutics that we might not be exploring today. So I think that that understanding and interpretability is super, super interesting. I actually don't, uh, this, is, this is maybe an edge view, but I don't necessarily see it as a necessary condition for adoption. Um, by contrast, what I think is necessary, uh, which is underrated in the current technology plus health space, is running the trial. Um, that the randomized trials are how we decide to adopt new technologies in medicine. Um, our, arguably, our problem in medicine is, is not that we don't, uh, that we fail to adopt enough new technology, but almost that we, we adopt too many new technologies. And so I'd say the bias is actually towards adopting things before we know that they work, even if we don't understand them. But the randomized trial is, I think, a really important way in which medicine um, ensures that, on average, the things that we're adopting are, are right. And so I think for us, um, you know, when we, when we feel like we've gotten uh, as much mileage as we can out of the observational data, we're starting to think about how we turn those into, into randomized trials, because I think that is the ultimate persuasion in, in medicine. I would add just one very quick thing on that. It relates back to the, the Kaiser point, which is adoption of these kinds of things uh, where you're, say, taking something that is picking up sort of, it, it manifests itself in the knee, so in some sense we've turned it back into clinical, we've turned the lack of housing back into clinical. On the other hand, I, I can certainly see a world in which a organization where they have more of the totality of healthcare spending and health over the longer run, being much more willing to take a, take a risk on a trial or to implement and measure outcomes, which is, I think, critically important. That, that point, sorry, since John picked up on my point, I'm gonna pick up on his point. Uh, I, I think that the, you know, the, I, the Kaiser example is a, is a wonderful instance of how these kinds of social determinants of health are getting the importance they deserve. I think the challenge in a lot of those questions is figuring out, like, Rather, rather than just spending a lot of money to make hospitals feel good about doing something about this, turning that into a specific channel that we can, that we can understand and improve and getting the right people to intervene on that channel is really hard. And so what makes me nervous sometimes is health systems spending lots of money on homelessness when their comparative advantage is the diagnosis and treatment of disease. And so I think that you know, if we want to attack homelessness, let's get the people who know about social policy and housing and, and, and not make mistakes like rent control. And, and it, like, there are all, these, there are all these, these domains where people know a lot about these things. And sometimes I worry when the, when the, when the healthcare system has well-intentioned forays into these areas, they're, they're not leveraging the expertise in behavioral science, in um, economics and social policy, in, in all of these other areas that have a lot to say about how we get people affordable housing. All right, I think we have time for one or two more questions. I saw this hand over here first. So, uh, thanks. Uh, I have two questions um, back on John's graph. So. When we think about people having skin in the game, I think when, at least as I look at it as an IO economist, not as a health economist, it seems like one of the missing pieces is just data on what things cost so that someone can make a decision. Um, and I was just curious if anybody is, any tech firms are working on that. So instead of having the margin be, I show up and somebody tells me, it's gonna be, I don't know, $1,000, and now I have to pay 60%, so I don't do it at all. The goal would be that I can make a decision about where to go because I can price shop, and then I do get it, but there's downward pressure on the market price, so I'm getting more affordable healthcare, but not as steep of a drop in healthcare. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And it seems like there's, there is the skin in the game, but not necessarily in the right way because we're missing the price component. And it's hard to see how we get a market where there is no price transparency to one that there is price transparency. And also like a cost benefit analysis a person could do. And that seems like a perfect place for some app 
tech company to step in for all the tech entrepreneurs here. Um, and then the second thing I was gonna say is instead of thinking about, you know, you have this idea that people should be spending more on a premium, um, one way to have skin in the game that I think works and anecdotally um, I've seen it work is health savings accounts. So instead of paying a higher premium for low income people, you can make them pay a higher premium that goes into a savings account that then rolls over and at some point if they save enough that keep to save the money, it's their retirement account. And people tend at least anecdotally to think of that retirement money as if it's like real money. Um, so they have skin in the game, but you're not putting that money just into some premium sink. You're actually, you know, bit benefiting or saving if you don't spend the money. So I'd like to hear your thoughts on health savings accounts and how those might bridge this bronze plan program. Sure. So um, I'll, I'll be relatively quick here. The, the interesting, so the answer, you're about six years too late, and it's one of the most spectacular stock failures ever to come out of <laughs> San Francisco is Castlight Health. Uh, and and it, uh, that is a, a slightly glib but also true is that their hypothesis was that price transparency is really important. The critical thing, I told you this study was unrepresentative. This was one of the best and largest implementations of price transparency alongside that high deductible switch. And I, the graph that I jumped over basically shows you that there's absolutely no price shopping, um, even on undifferentiated products, that all of the reduction in spending is simply people don't go to the doctor. Uh, and this is related to HSAs. I also don't see them. And the good news, I think, on this dimension is that increasingly the insurance industry has realized these don't work, and they're moving slowly, as they always do, away from these kind of demand side incentives. And there is an increasing focus, and I think this gets back to Kaiser or other incentives, which is models that incentivize the person who went to med school are much more likely to be effective at making trade-offs about health. If you think about conceptually, how do I make a decision at the margin about whether or not to get a treatment? I would much rather have the system and the doctor be incentivized. And I think you know, this paper and other papers that have come out sort of showing these kinds of skin in the game don't result in the simple economics that we've expected. Um, uh, that's, that's not really the case. Thanks.